In the last video, we did more example problems of stereochemistry, particularly including enantiomers, and enantiomers again, meaning the R and the S form around a chiral center. So can you pick out a chiral center? If so, can you draw them in a perspective form? And can you draw them in a Fisher projection form? So that's kind of where we ended up. Well, I told you also toward the end of that video that we need to have a chat. And this chat is going to be about an old history story concerning a man by the name of Jean Baptiste B.O. So we're looking at the late 1700s here. So late 1700s uh, into the 1800s, mid 1800s. I think he died 1850, 1860, somewhere in there. So what began to get created out of this whole field of stereochemistry? is right-handed and left-handed versions of molecules, but there's a problem. Here's the problem. These right-handed, left-handed molecules, they're called enantiomers. And those enantiomers have very similar characteristics. A lot of times, they have the same bowling point, not every time, but they do have a same bowling point. They could have the same melting point. They could have the same solubility. This makes things very complicated. The same density, as you can imagine. It's the same stuff, the same ingredients. So this is like taking a recipe, for instance, going into your kitchen and adding the flour first and then the sugar to make the cake. But if someone came in and used the sugar first and then added the flour second, it wouldn't turn out to be a cake anymore. It would turn out different. It's kind of weird. Strange. But one of the things that in antimers do have a difference in is the way that they rotate light. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking, well, yeah, this makes sense because this whole time we've been drawing carbons and, you know, we've been putting bonds like this and then we've been rotating things around and we're like, hey, there's different rotations. So it probably does rotate light a different way. Uh-uh-uh. No, 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 no. This is the first misconception that people have in organic. The way that these molecules rotate around a chiral center has nothing to do with the way that they rotate light. I'm going to say that again. When you assign rotation around a chiral center, that is all that you're doing. You're telling me, you're giving me a clue of how this molecule is oriented. That's all that you're doing. That's it and nothing more. You are not telling me the way that it rotates light. This is a completely separate category, folks. The two are not related at all. And the common problem that people have in organic, they think that they are. And they're not. So molecules can rotate light left-handed and they can rotate light right-handed. Well, we have different designations for these. If it rotates light right-handed, we'll put a positive on there. If it rotates light left-handed, we'll put a negative on it. Notice these are not R's and S's. So what this means is that I could have a R molecule that rotates clockwise based on the groups that are on that chiral carbon. And that R could rotate light left or the R could rotate light right. It could do either or. 
L is going to be the same way, left-handed, right? So these were our S's. I could have a negative S and I could have a positive S. The S represents counterclockwise around the chiral center, and the positives and the negatives represent how it rotates light. Totally separate issue. The problem is that we're still talking about left-handed, right-handed, and that's where the confusion begins to happen. So I write all four of these up on the screen, so that way you can understand that all four of these are a possibility, folks. They are completely separate categories that should be thought of completely different. Just because a chiral center goes right-handed does not mean that it's going to be right-handed when it rotates light. It has nothing to do with each other. Nothing at all. Treat them separate. Keep them in their separate boxes. And do not confuse the two. So, the next question. If you're telling me that these molecules rotate light, left-handed or right-handed, how do we determine that? What kind of structural thing do we need to look at in order to pick out the difference? Well, here's the answer. There isn't one. The only way that you can determine if something is going to rotate light in the direction that it does is actually do it in the lab. That's it. There is no key indicator. There is nothing structural that we need to look at in order to determine if it will rotate light left or right. This is just circumstance. It's just random. So we really do have to take this molecule into a laboratory. We have to analyze it in a laboratory in order to figure out if it's positive or if it's negative. Meaning, how is it rotating light? Now, I can take that molecule and we can designate it as R or S, right? I mean, we can do that fairly easy. We've been doing that. But we cannot assign it a positive or a negative unless we know something about it first, as far as literature, or unless we go into the lab and actually do it to see what it turns out to be. So all of this is going to lead into Jean-Baptiste Biot's field of study. And Jean-Baptiste concerned himself with optical activity. Optical, optics, light. It's what you see, or light. That's how you see. Activity means how it rotates it. So does it go positive or does it go negative? Does it turn it left or does it turn it right? Physically, what is it doing? So this creates optical activity. All enantiomers have optical activity. If it has a chiral center, it has optical activity. We just need to measure it or we just need to be able to work with it. So what does optical activity really mean? Okay, well, here's the story. You have light energy, right? So imagine sunlight. And the thing with sunlight is that it produces waves in all directions. So that's what I'm going to represent here. All directions. There's no control of it, right? All light energy. Well, Jean-Baptiste, back in the day, again, later in the 1700s, early half of the 1800s, said, well, what if we take this light and what if we trim it? Trim it down. So I'm going to create a little sliver, right? And I'm going to let light energy pass through here. But the orientation of that sliver will only allow one direction to come into play. Just one. It prevents all of the other wavelengths from coming through as far as directions. Okay, very simplified version. This is how I want you to think about it. So the only one that would be able to escape would be light that actually goes straight up and straight down. One orientation, that's it. 
So raw light energy or the raw light source provides all directions. It goes through this little piece that's cut out in a way so we don't really allow all to come through anymore. And now we limit ourselves to only one direction, like the band or the X band. What Jean Baptiste Biot then decided to do was to take some molecules. And let's take these molecules and let's put them in the presence of this light. And we'll put them in a tunnel. That way they can't go anywhere, the light can't go anywhere, it can't escape, more light can't come in and so forth. Kind of a black, dark tunnel that the train's getting ready to come through. And over here at the end, there's an eyepiece. I'm looking at it. What happens? Well, Jean-Baptiste took this dark tunnel with nothing in it first. And he took light energy, he went through this piece that slivered it down into one direction only, and he looked through. Uh, he looked at the other end of the tunnel, and he saw light. Ding, ding! We see it. Yes, it works. And then he said, okay, well, these molecules, what would happen if I put these molecules in the presence of that one direction? Will that one direction stay up and down? Or will it turn left hand or right hand? Will there be a different orientation on it by the time it gets at the end? So he took some molecules and he put it into this long chamber, this long tube. And he turned the light bulb on. He made sure only one direction came through. He looked at the other end. And he did not see any light energy come through at all. All right, so imagine that this is the eyepiece here that you're looking at, like a microscope. Well, what he decided to do is to put a turntable on it. And this turntable was graduated tick marks all the way around, and these tick marks measured angles. And this turntable could freely go left hand or it could freely go right hand. So when he looked through this microscope eyepiece, and he didn't see any light come through, he said, okay, well, this maybe is a sign that these molecules are beginning to rotate light. I've just got to figure out how much, and I've got to figure out which direction. So he grabbed a hold of this dial, and he started to dial left hand or right hand, and he turned and turned and turned and turned until he actually saw light energy come through. If he could see the light then he would read the readout and he would say this molecule rotated light it rotated light either left hand or right hand and in addition to that this is how much it rotated that light this is really what Jean Baptiste Bio began to dabble in in terms of organic chemistry well, what was going on here is that these molecules would get the light energy one direction up and down. And what would happen is that over time, they would slightly turn this light energy in a particular direction. And then once the light really escaped the molecule, it stayed in that direction. And we were able to record that setting we were able to record that property, just like boiling point, just like melting point, just like density. It is a property that's assigned to these chiral carbons. Well, this entire contraption, this instrument, is going to be called a polarimeter. And we use a polarimeter in a laboratory for many different purposes. Okay, we just don't put organics in it just to see if we can get positive or negative rotation. There are so many things that we can do with it. And if I just talk about the food industry alone, 
the food industry will use a polarimeter like a company like Coca-Cola, and this will allow them to get some data on maybe the Coca-Cola that they are pumping into those cans to sell to you as a consumer. And that should have a certain sugar content in it. And that sugar content is a chiral compound, and that chiral compound has rotation. So if they can measure how much rotation is actually getting delivered in that Coca-Cola solution before they put it into a can, they will know the proper sugar concentration of what that formulation should be. And if it checks out, then great. They put it into the cans and they sell it to you. Folks, that's just one example of why they would use a polarimeter today. Well... Jean-Baptiste Biot wasn't very pretty. I mean, if you ask me, he looks like something that would come out of a creepy movie, like The Ring. I see him crawling out of a well, and I see him on all fours being all crooked and nasty and trying to come through your TV screen, right? I mean, sorry, that's just what I see. But this is Jean-Baptiste Biot. Now, granted, this picture that I'm showing you on the left, this is probably toward the end of his life and the picture up in the top right hand corner well it's a little bit better but I still think it's a creepy movie but Jean-Baptiste Biot studied what we call plain polarized light that is this concept that light can be given to you in one direction and that one direction can be rotated left-handed or right-handed and we can measure those settings we can measure that movement. Well, he also loved to study meteorites. Not a big deal, right? I mean, kind of interesting guy, maybe. And he also believed that rocks in outer space could fall and hit the Earth. Kind of strange back in the day for someone to think that, quite honestly. But it's true, right? I mean, think about meteorites and everything else. So he was right on that. Good for him. He was kind of ahead of the curve. He also believed that you could take these universe rocks and you could break them down, you could do some tests on them, and you could look at their percent composition. And he said, if you knew the percent composition of those rocks, then this is going to give you an idea of the percent composition that's out there in outer space, up in the sky. What is up there? What can't we reach? Well, the rocks are going to give you a clue to that. Let's look at the physical makeup. I mean, it's coming from somewhere. How did it form? And if we can get an idea of how those formed, we can get an idea of where it originated and maybe what we're up against later on in the future. He also was the leader that basically told the scientific community these things can rotate light left-handed or right-handed, clockwise or counterclockwise, with a few caveats. There's a few variables in this equation. There's a few variables that we have to kind of take into consideration in order for this to happen. And Jean-Baptiste Biot was also on a balloon with Guy Lussac. And if you studied general chemistry like you were supposed to, Guy Lussac was part of the uh, ideal gas equation theory, gas laws, and so forth. And what you would have discovered during this time is that all of these scientists that were involved in the gas laws, one of the very easy ways to look at gas laws would be things like hot air balloons. So Guy Lussac had a hot air balloon. He was measuring what was going on between something like volumes and temperatures. Hence, let's heat up a gas, that gas would expand, that gas would expand something like a hot air balloon, and it would lift you up off the ground. Well, the problem here is that no one else really knew what was going on in the scientific community. It was way before the internet took place. So, up in the air they went, Guy Lussac and Jean-Baptiste Biot, and they started to float in air. And they were over Paris and when they were over Paris, all the people on the street were looking up into the sky. And you can imagine, 
you can imagine what was going on. They were looking at this weird contraption, this strange thing that they've never seen before that we know as a hot air balloon, and they had no clue what it was bringing. And this hot air balloon was lowering and lowering and lowering, and they all went crazy, folks, and they attacked the hot air balloon as it got closer and closer to the ground. Well, then they realized there were actually humans on the inside, and they wanted to know who they were and what they were doing and so forth. How did you come from the sky? What is that contraption that you're in? We've never seen anything like this before. So Jean-Baptiste Biot and Guy Lussac were almost killed just simply because of the unknown. Well, Jean-Baptiste created what we called maybe our first polarimeter. And that is basically the diagram that I've just showed you. So we have a light source over here to the left. And this light source is going to give you light in all directions. And this is what we call normal light. And then we send it through a sliver. And this sliver is going to only allow one direction to go through. And we call this a polarizer, which is why we call this a polarimeter. So after the polarizer point, you can kind of guarantee that only one direction of light is now coming through. This was a variable that had to be deleted from the equation, right? You can't make these measurements if you just allow everything in all directions to come through. It's not going to work. You have to have some control of it in a certain way. And we use a polarizer in order to do that. Very similar to the polarizer on your sunglasses. You know you've got a really good pair of sunglasses if it is polarizing light. It's what you want it to do. You just don't want to pay $5 for a pair of sunglasses to put it on your face to make yourself look pretty. Well, you're using sunglasses for a reason, and that's to prevent UV light from hitting your eyeballs, right? So the more expensive pairs of sunglasses typically have these polarized lens on them that will allow that purpose to happen. It changes this light and it turns it and it prevents that light from hitting your eyeballs the way that it normally would if you just didn't have any on. And that's better than a piece of plastic and just a coating lens, which is why there's a price difference between the two. So what we're going to find out is that this polarimeter, this is just the first part. There's more to the story. And you're going to learn more about that next story in the next video. But this is the entry of what we would call the polarimeter from this creepy guy, Jean-Baptiste Biot. But what he did was pretty important because, folks, we still use it today. Back in the 1700s, he discovered something that is so important that we still use it in today's laboratory environment. Not too many of these guys can say that, but this is why his picture's in a textbook. This is why we talk about him by name, because credit needs to be given where credit is due, and Jean-Baptiste Biot did earn it. So in the next video, we'll pick up from there, and we'll talk about the rest of the polarimeter and how it relates to optical activity.